you know, bleeds very nicely into the next uh, panel discussion, and that is um, economic transformation. You know, it will explore on how societies and um, economies should re react to a digital world, and how individuals and industry can become constantly innovative and adaptive, you know, being ready to seize opportunities and harness the potential of technology. And to share their insights on this topic, we have with us today Senator Michaela Cash, Minister for Jobs and Innovation Australia. We also have Mr. Shalindra Singh, Managing Director of Sokoa Capital. And last but not least, Mr. Piyush Gupta, CEO and Director of DBS Group. And if we could welcome them on stage for this next panel discussion. Thank you. Moving right onward, a great uh, segue it was. Thank you, uh, Glenda, for that. Because indeed, we want to talk now about economic transformation. And that is, in, in so many ways, the metric that we use. Although I think one of the very important things about Smart Nation more broadly is that we think beyond just measures such as economic growth, but uh, what, what is achieved through economic growth through full participation in the economy, which is going to be a big theme, is of course the positive societal spillover effects that that has. And uh, so I think that's going to be a very important theme for us to dive into. We have a, a perfect panel to do this, really representatives from government, the financial sector, the technology sector. So I'm very, very delighted uh, to kick off this uh, second panel with immediately to my left, the Honorable Senator Michalia Cash, who is the Minister for Jobs and Innovation for the Australian government. She was first elected to office in the year 2007. She was previously the Minister for Employment, Minister for Women, Minister for Assisting, the Prime Minister for Public Service. So very rich cross-governmental set of experiences. Looking forward to your views. Immediately to her left, uh, Shalendra Singh, who is the Managing Director at Sequoia Capital, one of course the world's leading venture capital firms. He has led Sequoia's investments in Carousel, Gojek, Credex, Zilingo, and many other uh, companies that are all neologisms in their names, uh, I'm sure. Um, a lot of which, uh, certainly Gojek and others that are uh, very much household names and coming to a street in Singapore near you, as I'm sure everyone uh, knows. And you're also a Kaufman Fellow and you previously founded Jalva Media in uh, Silicon Valley. And indeed, to his left, uh, Piyush Gupta, who's a CEO and director of the DBS Group, one of the leading financial services groups in Asia, with a growing presence in greater China, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, very much a, a pan-Asian bank and, uh, and growing as Asia grows, which is very uh, promising. DBS is, of course, headquartered here in Singapore, and the bank has been recognized for its leadership in the region. It has been conferred uh, the honor of Asia's best bank by the banker and Euromoney, and Asian Bank of the Year by IFR uh, Asia. So again, a very, very uh, distinguished panel. I'm excited to uh, kick off with the same format that we had before. We'll have uh, each of you contributing for a couple of minutes around where you see um, the digital technologies contributing to economic transformation. Love to hear your experience from the Australian angle, which uh, a country that has been quite steadily moving up to the top of many smart nation rankings and industries because of the policies that your government has been pursuing. So please, Michalia. Absolutely, and thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to contribute to what I think is a really important conversation today. I mean, from the Australian government's perspective, we very much look at this this global economic transformation as something that within Australia we have to see as a government, as industry and as a, and as a society as being what we now call business as usual. There is no option. From our perspective as a government, we very much take a three-pronged approach. The first is obviously government must lead by example. And the way you can lead by example is ensuring that you have a public service, because obviously government uh, controls the public service. You have a public service that is innovative and is adaptive. And that is certainly something that as an Australian government, we are focusing on. Um, the second pillar, though, is obviously, as a government, you've got to put in place the right policy framework so that industry, so that business can prosper and grow. I mean, I often say to people that governments themselves don't create jobs. That's the role of industry. That's the role of business. So you need to ensure as a government you are fostering the right environment for that job creation. And of course, the third pillar, uh, which I think has been touched on by all speakers, but in particular by Caesar uh, in his keynote address, 
as a government, we need to ensure we are bringing all Australians with us. The opportunity to participate uh, in the digital economy um, must be afforded to everybody. Later on this year, the government will be releasing our digital economy strategy. It is very much based around five pillars. The first is, of course, connectivity. Mm -hmm. If you don't have connectivity, uh, you actually can't participate. So what is the role of government in providing that economic infrastructure? Digital skills for everybody. As I said, bring all Australians with you. So what is the role of government in ensuring that all Australians, regardless of who you are or where you come from, you have the relevant digital skills? Uh, we have to have a really good look at our regulatory environment. Uh, th this is our new world. We need to ensure that in Australia, we're encouraging businesses to foster and grow. But at the same time, we've got 24 million people. We need to ensure that other parts of the world are looking to us and saying, we want to invest in Australia. Um, I think another key point that we're looking at is access to all businesses. It's always interesting to hear um, you know, big businesses put their perspective forward because I think it's well known. Big businesses are able to adapt for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. So the role of government, in particular in Australia, is to ensure that we're enabling our small and medium businesses to get the digital skills they need so they can participate in this economic transformation. And of course then overlaying all of that, I think is an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, and it's of course cyber security. Cyber, what is the role now of cyber security? If we are all going to be participating in this economic transformation, it is going to be business as usual. Um, what are the cyber security uh, implications? So from the Australian government perspective, a three-pronged approach based around those pillars. Mm -hmm. Both yourself and DPM earlier today raised this uh, spectre, and it's, it's critical uh, because, of course, the scenarios, the downside scenarios are, are truly worrying, and uh, we should have um, an even more robust conversation in other places, as such as is taking place here, around what the consequences and, and what preparations are needed. Shalanda, uh, you know, Sequoia is such an important part of the growth story of, uh, of digitization of economies here in Southeast Asia, certainly worldwide already. You're making bigger and bigger bets in Asia. So let's hear it from your point of view around economic transformation. Yeah, first, thank you. It's an honor to be here, uh, a great privilege. Um, uh, I'm Shalendra Singh. I've been at Sequoia for a little over 12 years. And uh, in, during this time, I've focused on investments in emerging markets in India and Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia in the last five or six years. And um, you know, I've had the privilege to meet uh, maybe seven, eight, 10,000 entrepreneurs, something of that order of magnitude in the last 10 years, 12 years. And uh, it's been the most uh, uplifting and humbling experience to uh, look at um, you know, young companies and see them grow uh, in, in this part of the world. And uh, as Sequoia, uh, our, um, our motto for the last 46 years, uh, Sequoia is a Silicon Valley firm, uh, started with the objective to help partner with founders to create enduring companies, companies that could last generations, uh, sort of outlive uh, ourselves. And um, you know, uh, as, we, as we went down that journey, and, and we were very lucky to partner with some incredible founders over the years, we realized about 12, 13 years ago that um, innovation was going to become um, highly democratized. And, um, uh, you know, China, India, Asia specifically, and this region would play an extremely important role. And so about 13 years ago, Sequoia decided to start Sequoia China. 12 years ago, decided to start India. And fast forward today, we have now made close to 600 to 700 investments in technology companies all over Asia. And, uh, Out of a potential uh, hundreds of thousands, because you get more PowerPoint decks yeah. every day than the rest of us put together right now. <laughs> Correct. Well, we have this incredible privilege of partnering with founders who are sort of shaping the future and sort of get a front row seat to that. And we couldn't be more excited about what's happening in Asia. And this is a little bit double clicking on what Caesar said in the morning, that it's quite likely that the center of technology in the world is now shifting to Asia. And I don't think uh, many people in Silicon Valley have fully appreciated it yet, but the pace and rise of tech companies in, um, in China, in Southeast Asia, in India is simply staggering. And um, there is two, three main drivers of it. One is that, like I said, innovation is highly uh, democratized at this point. It no longer matters where a company is born. It no longer matters you know, how much money uh, a set of engineers have to launch their new product or service. Um, 
because you know there's so much capital available to fund innovation all around the world at this point, and at least in most parts of the world, that uh, you know a small team sitting in a city that uh, most people can't pinpoint on a map can, you know, overnight get hundreds of millions of downloads around the world, and so that's the other thing. You know, the spread of technology has also gotten democratized with the rise of app stores and so on and so forth. And then the third is the mobile device, you know, sitting in the pocket of people, you know, millions of people. And this is where Asia, with four billion people, Asia Pacific region, you know, it's just a power, powerful, very powerful market driving all the future trends. So we couldn't be more excited about everything we've seen here, and uh, we are very, very bullish on uh, on what we've seen in uh, Southeast Asia, in China, in India, and more interestingly, the convergence of companies across these markets. So it's no longer, we constantly have these internal, very, you know, um, uh, sometimes fun uh, discussions and arguments saying, where does a company belong? Because we can no longer say where a company belongs. You know, because it may be, the engineers may be based in one country, it may be domiciled in a second country, and the usage may be in another country. So, and we have routinely ended up investing in companies. Uh, so we, ha we, we call this, you know, this, this thesis of blurring borders. And I think, you know, Singapore has actually a very important role to play, in my opinion, in what's happening in Asia. And uh, I find, uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, people in Singapore actually very significantly underappreciate how strong the tech ecosystem already is and how fast it's evolving. So in the last five, six years, I've had a chance to observe it closely. And I'm very, very pleasantly surprised by how exciting Singapore is um, in terms of how it's emerging into a tech hub. And I, I'm uh, quite optimistic about that. You should no doubt you are as well. You're a, you know, you're a financial CEO, but also in a way a tech company CEO. You've become a digital bank very much so uh, at DBS. So, and of course, everyone in Singapore, or, you know, it's the largest uh, bank, of course, in the country. So uh, how are you seeing, not just in Singapore, but Pan-Asian as you expand uh, beyond and blur the boundaries very much the way the tech companies are? How are you seeing the economic transformation play out? So, Parag, I thought what I might do is uh, focus a little bit on our industry, and perhaps that's a good uh, case study to think about how industry transformation is actually occurring. occurring. And I thought I'd uh, talk about three things. One, industry transformation. Second is participant or firm transformation. And third is, you know, some obviously upsides or potential unintended consequences of this kind of transformation. So in category one, industry transformation, I mean, some things are obvious. You talked about mobile, so did uh, Caesar earlier. I think mobile is a game changer for banking because in the past, you went to a bank. Today, the bank goes with you. And because the bank goes with you, it changes the context of what a bank means. You know, location, context become extremely important. I sometimes say the vision for banking in the future is to make banking invisible. Because you can hide the bank and what you're really doing with the rest of your life and what you want to do. And that thinking is quite a game changer for our industry. So what does it mean for, what is the nature of banking itself? Uh, the second is this whole idea of a network economy, shared economy. Uh, earlier, the, it was quite simple. You had savers who saved, which is the households, and corporations and entities borrowed. Well, today is quite different. You know, the individuals borrow, individuals lend money, companies borrow, companies lend money. So you don't have consumers and producers, you have a world of prosumers. Mm -hmm. And as you think about blockchain and overlay that on the network economy, uh, that notion that you could eliminate a hub and spoke mechanism, I, everybody can participate, everybody directly, can have really profound consequence for industry structure. Most of financial services based around stock exchanges, banks, central banks, so central keepers of records. In a distributed ledger economy, you don't need central keepers of records anymore. So what does that mean for industry structure? It's still something that needs to be played out. Uh, third agenda is, I mean, we just talked about data. Obviously, data is a big thing. Uh, somebody called data the new oil. I think data is more than the new oil. I think data is the new air. Because oil, you can still yes. ring fence and control. <laughs> air, you can't. I think that's important because when everybody thinks about regulating data, I think two years from now with 5G and IoT, the amount of data you will be spraying out, you will not be able to control. So we really have to think hard about what Murad says. What are the guiding rules for data? But that data has important consequence, obviously, for our industry. How do you underwrite credit? How do you do trading with algorithmic trading? How do you use robotic process automation? And what does it do for efficiencies? Uh, and finally, obviously, cloud and just the automation compute power, the, 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 the curve, the cost curve, means everybody can get into the game. You know, you just don't need scale to be a participant. Now, these last two things have profound implication for industry participation. So who plays in this new industry? 
uh, the value chain is unbundling. You can be a startup and be a small fintech and unbundle some part of the value chain. I think most of the small startups wind up being collaborators with existing players. But you also have the big companies, the Googles, Facebooks, and Alibabas, who have ownership of customer and ownership of data, which now becomes the central theme around which participants need to organize. So I think you can have very dramatic change in industry participation as you go forward, with some of the big tech oligarchs playing a really important role in the future of the industry. Now these have all profound consequences at an industry level. At a firm level, you alluded to this, you know, we've taken a lead, um, we're privileged to be named the best digital bank in the world, but we've had to rethink everything. How do we acquire customers? We used to acquire through brick and mortar, branches, relationship managers, now it's all electronic. How do you transact without paper so you can do instant fulfillment that changes the cost point, but changes the way people deal with you? How do you engage with customers differently so that you can use data to market contextually at the right time? One of the main changes we had to make in our thinking is, uh, you know, we were a pipeline business, we went direct to customer. But increasingly, you have to learn how to work with partnerships in an ecosystem. That's a very profound difference in the way you actually run your firm at a bank level. So they're, they're quite important changes to how the firm needs to run. Uh, but quickly, the third point, I think all of this means that there could be some upsides, but there could be some downsides as well, reflecting on, again, in the, consequence, in the context of our industry. You take data, the good news with data is you can do financial inclusion. So today you can reach out to hundreds of millions of people through M-Pesa, through the Jandan Yojana in India, millions of people who would not have access to financial services, good news. Bad news, a large part of our industry's models have been created on socialization of risk. It's based on the premise that you don't know. You think about insurance. Insurance exists because all of us share the risk because we don't know who's likely to have an accident and who's likely to fall in. So we all share the premium and everybody gets protection. Once you do know, that leads to financial exclusion. Because if I know for sure that you're going to have cancer and you're not, I won't insure you, but you don't need the insurance. So what does that mean for the model of the insurance industry? So you've got to think a little bit about unintended consequences of data in our industry. The second unintended consequence is around uh, the idea of jobs. We are today very proud as the leading digital bank in the world that we are automating and digitizing everything. My branch staff is down by half. My call center staff is down by half. I'm using robotic process automation. But what does it mean to the nature of jobs? What does it mean to where the jobs come from? Yep. I mean, think about, you know, when the car got created, Henry Ford said then, when people asked him who'll buy a car, he said the workers will buy the car. But what happens if there are no workers, then who buys the car? So you've got to think a little bit about the unintended consequences of, you know, that. And finally, this unintended consequence of the change in the industry structure, I think it's a great thing that there's a lot of participation in the industry. But we also know from just recently, 10 years ago, that the lack of oversight and regulation can create substantial systemic risk. At the end of the day, money greases the oil, the engines of the economy. But unregulated and unsupervised and unlegislated actors and activities could create a lot of systemic risk in the system as well. And that's not something we understand and know. So we need to think a little bit about that as well as we go forward. Excellent opening, opening points. And I hope that uh, everyone by now has tweeted, data is the new air. Uh, very memorable. And I, we will come back to that point as well, because there's a lot to, to be said for what that means uh, for the economy. What each of you have, uh, have spoken about to some degree, and there's been some, some overlap, and it's the issue that I wanted to, in any case, move into for a more in-depth uh, statement from each of you, is really about which industries need the most digital transformation, which need to be digitized the most, or as they're digitized, which uh, are, are creating the most unintended consequences, as Piyush just mentioned, in terms of dislocation. And uh, you, know, you have a whole very large country, not a large population, but a very large country that you're working with. So give us now the, the real world ground eye sort of view around where you are struggling the most. And just a, just a one word of context. Uh, you know, in Singapore, we went through the Committee on Future Economy uh, process, and, and I, I served on one of those committees. And one of the uh, responses to it was, well, where is, the, where is the plan? Where is the single bullet sort of answer? And it was, to me, uh, a lesson in uh, sort of almost communication. Maybe people didn't realize that this is one of the most diverse economies in the entire world. For such a small country, almost every single possible industry, with uh, the exception of really agriculture, you know, is strongly represented here. And so you cannot have a silver bullet answer for what industrial transformation is going to look like because every industry will have to go through its own learning curve and have its own uh, roadmap. So with that in mind, 
looking at a much larger uh, country of Australia, where are you seeing the, the toughest pain points in the, in the transformation of specific industries uh, to keep pace with technological change, and, and what are you doing about it? You know, it, it's a fascinating question. And, and, you know, Australia has actually been transforming now uh, for many, many, many years. I mean, you look at our economy. Our economy is very much a resources-based economy. Um, so we have a mining industry that quite literally now for, you know, 10, 15 years has been looking at the impact of automation. And, in fact, we actually are the number one country when it comes to automated mining. So we've already been through what is the impact of automation on literally your economy yeah. and how do you embrace it and create more jobs. And we've done that successfully. I think probably though the most recent issue um, of the impact of you know, this transformation on the Australian economy is in relation to our car industry. Um, I mean, many people would be aware uh, that last year, the three major car manufacturers in Australia, Holden, Ford and Toyota, they actually closed their doors. Um, that was obviously a significant impact on our economy. Um, we had a very long and proud history of manufacturing cars in Australia, uh, but our reality became uh, we could no longer, or the companies could no longer uh, effectively compete in that global market. But I think the strategies that were put in place by government and by the companies working with the unions and the employees mm -hmm. meant that for a number of years, we were able to put in place processes that ensured that, well, yes, you were seeing the end of an industry in Australia, which meant the end of thousands of jobs. The process that was put in place took us back to ensuring that the companies worked with the workers to ensure that they had a very long lead time to be appropriately skilled into higher tech jobs that were going to be available within the car manufacturing industry, even if we weren't manufacturing cars. Or alternatively, they identified where other opportunities were um, throughout Australia, recognised what the skills gaps were and then worked with the employees to give them the appropriate skills. It is actually the example of what is a good news story. An industry has closed down in Australia, thousands of jobs were affected, but to date, in excess of 80% of those employees have gone on to either work for the relevant companies in another role, have taken on alternative employment, have gone on to full-time study, or have voluntarily left the workforce. And those companies now continue to work with the remaining workers to ensure that they are able to continue in the workforce. And this is an all too uncommon story because there Correct. are only a few countries where we're seeing this happen. Uh, Switzerland is one, Germany yep. is another, Korea, uh, and, and, and Singapore is working on this uh, as well, though of course not in the automotive sector, but, but others. But it's a very, very rare success story. And this is really what inclusive growth is all about. It's not just about the bottom billion, but it's about these industrial uh, transformations. I actually do want to come back to another industry in Australia, uh, maybe in the next round though, but it is education. because, Or maybe even right now, let's just talk about it. Because uh, you would it's a very large, uh, fast, fat, one of the fastest growing sectors, and it's being digitized. A lot of Singaporeans and other Asians have an experience with physical uh, you know, education at an Australian campus or coming back. But I think it would be interesting to talk about the role of digital education as an export, because it is a large and growing Australian export. And Singaporeans are going to be very interested in that for ourselves and for our children. Uh, international education is something that Australia is incredibly proud of, and in fact, it is our third largest export industry. Mm -hmm. So it is something that, as a country, we acknowledge. We have a good product, and we need to do everything that we can to ensure that it remains as a key destination country for others looking in. Um, I think the key to the Australian education sector, though, is the realisation that the way that we used to educate is not going to be the way we educate in the future. And it very much goes back to, and in fact, your previous panel discussed it, it's the new approach to learning, lifelong learning. In fact, we often say in Australia, uh, the way you're going to have to literally, as an individual now, approach uh, learning going forward is you'll learn, you'll unlearn, you'll relearn, mm -hmm. and it's how our education institutes uh, respond to that. And I think one of the most effective ways of responding to that is to enable all courses to be done on line and but ensuring that you have the quality in terms of the degree or the course that you're actually offering and i think australia has been doing this now for a number of years probably because though it is one of our greatest um 
exports and we know that we have to continually invest in it. But it's all about adaptation and that is something we're good at. And Singaporeans now are, are literally born with uh, their education passports. And they, so they absolutely. Are. And we obviously welcome Singaporeans to Australia. Which global uh, absolutely. online degrees absolutely. can be fed into that, into that passport. It's very, very exciting. Now, a lot of this has been made possible because of the foundational layer of technology that particularly large technology providers have, have, have put in place. And this is one of the really transformative shifts. Infrastructure, such as we think of it, has historically been provided largely by the public sector. But when it comes to internet connectivity, and as we move into uh, 5G, it really has been the private sector uh, in, in most of the world, uh, with exceptions, obviously, like China. But the private sector has been providing this base. And that has also, of course, uh, both from a standpoint, from a financial standpoint of the size of the technology sector and, of course, the data that they have access to and control. That has created sort of big tech. So when people think about digital transformation of the economy, Shalendra, they generally think they almost hold it to be synonymous with the big tech company. So let me get your view on, um, you know, are we at a, a point where big tech is the new foundation for digital transformation or where big tech is being is viewed, uh, rightly or wrongly, as, as almost taking over too much of that uh, pie? Now, first, I think we are in an unprecedented time in history where seven of the world's 10 largest market cap companies are te tech companies. And uh, if you counted the market cap of the top tech co 10 companies in the world, 78% of that market cap uh, belongs to tech companies just in the top 10. Now, that's not representative of the whole economy, but you could say in the, in the most powerful 10 companies, there's an 80-20 uh, you know, uh, market cap of tech companies, which is staggering. Now, what's even more scary is that these tech companies are actually growing faster than the rest. Many of these companies are still compounding at 30, 40, 50 percent. So I think on the one hand, um, as we think five, 10 years out, not very distant future, near term future, we're going to see continued um, uh, this uh, strength and might of the big tech companies continue to grow. And I think it has lots of implications for society, for innovation, for regulation. Um, you know, I think uh, governments uh, will be, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a bipolar world, governments will be working harder to figure out how to regulate and how to ensure data privacy, how to ensure fair practices, how to ensure, um, a, you know, um, a level playing field, you know, from a regulatory perspective or things like uh, financial services and fintech we were chatting about this morning. So I think uh, lots is going to come. But I'd say one thing which is very interesting about Asia uh, and when it comes to tech. I think all the traditional tech companies were built with a technology first mindset, meaning that they were, they mostly evolved with thin layers of technology. You know, on a new, on a new uh, area, it could have been software, it could have been search, it could have been, you know, social networks, it could have been messaging uh, in the case of Tencent or, you know, an e-commerce platform. But now tech has become so mainstream and the amount of capital available to new tech startups is so extraordinary uh, in the last five, seven years that we see the emergence of what we call the full stack business models, meaning it is no longer just about tech. It is about the combination of a traditional industry and tech with a, with a call it a, a full stack approach. So think how the world has evolved where Netflix is now a very large creator of content, which it wasn't initially, mm -hmm. uh, or Amazon has now bought F Whole Foods, or in China you hear about new retail. So this convergence of tech and non-tech. And we have multiple examples in our portfolio. We have a company called Oyo Rooms that is disrupting the budget hotel segment uh, all over India and now in many uh, markets, including in China. And um, they take full ownership of the user experience. So it's not just an OTA or an online travel agency, which was called the first generation model. So the new generation models will be cloud kitchens. So now imagine you don't need to have McDonald's where people have physical stores like, like we were hearing in the morning. But we have a company that has six online brands of food where people order food. And you go to all these brands, and they're highly reviewed and rated. But they're actually they're just cloud kitchens. There's no actual physical store you walk into. And you know, they work only on delivery. Similarly, there is uh, you know, virtual hospitals in China coming up where, hey, you'll go online. You'll select a great surgeon. And then you'll go to WeWork type hospital location, which is for rental. And you'll get your surgery conducted. But it'll be, a, you know, it'll be shared infrastructure. So, so uh, I mean, we live, we live in a very we hospital. <laughs> Sorry, it's called we hospital. <laughs> yeah. So, I think we live now in a very interesting world where we are going to see, 
you know, not just the traditional form of tech companies which only do technology, we are going to see fully integrated companies like Tech WeWork. It's not really a tech company. They have physical spaces all around the world. So, you know, we're going to see more and more of these full stack business models and, and the implications are the traditional companies, you know, traditional incumbents across every industry are going to see much more of a frontal assault by a new entrepreneur and a new, newly imagined business model. We call them mutants, you know, sort of a business <laughs> model that mutates. Uh, you know, the mutants are attacking the traditional incumbents in most industries. And, and you know, the full stack, we, we have an we uh, investment in a company that's trying to now, you know, um, uh, do uh, a sort of disintermediate telcos and create a mobile-oriented, you know, uh, full-stack telecom application without owning any of the infrastructure. So I think across industries, we're going to see this new trend. And uh, to that extent, I think um, th there is, while the, while the existing companies become more and more dominant, I think, I think it's a little scary, you know, imagining that some of these companies could be worth three, four, five trillion dollars if you take a 10-year view, and, you know, whether traditional industries will keep up. On the other hand, I think these new wave of companies will also come up. And their models are sufficiently different with this full stack approach that they will, um, uh, they will create new, new kinds of companies altogether. I hope this is raising lots of questions that everyone is going to uh, put into a pigeonhole uh, because we'll be coming to your, your questions uh, in just a little bit. Can no, we... Parag, let me just quickly yeah. amplify it, Sharon, before you throw yeah. it open. So one, I couldn't agree with him uh, more. So I think your question's a flawed question. He's saying which, <laughs> well, he said which industry is likely to be more impacted. I think that's a wrong way to think about it. There is no industry which will not be impacted right. because today technology is business. Mm -hmm. And I think the right way to think about it, therefore, is the horizontals. Mm -hmm. So what is it, you know, you think about Uber. Uber is not about technology. It's about reimagining what people want to do when they travel. And so all of the examples Sharon gave tell you that thinking in vertical industries is the, is the wrong way to think mm -hmm. because you're not going to get the mutant ways of thinking which are horizontals, which means every, everything's going to be impacted. Uh, the other comment on uh, what Shansi, I think is right, there's a lot of um, you know, centralization of power on the one hand. Uh, I do think there's always the opportunity, increasingly the mutant opportunity. Uh, I do think also, however, that legacy companies do have an opportunity to play, because legacy companies bring exactly the same, have exactly the same recourse to modern technology. In fact, this technology is open, what Caesar said, it's all open source. You can go take what you want and piece it together. So the real question is, how do you change your mindset? And change your mindset to really think horizontally, think in terms of journeys, think in terms of customer experiences, as opposed to think vertically. And if you can achieve that, then frankly, anybody can be a player. Now, unfortunately, because you know this winner take most of winner take all is true, people who are first to market and have created disproportionate customer bases and dis disproportionate market size <laughs> will always have an advantage. It's not easy to go up against. And to, just to emphasize the importance of the traditional companies, when you refer to shared infrastructure, actually, it is owned infrastructure that is being made available for partial usage. And just look at the automotive industry, for an example. Uh, BMW and others call themselves mobility companies now uh, because they own the assets. So indeed, the role of the traditional uh, firms is still very important. Owning the pipes, if you will, which banks, of course, still very much do, actually underpinning financial transactions. The best way to get at how cross-cutting all of this is, because I agree with Piyush's point that one can't just have a siloed view, is to humanize it further. So let, let me just follow up with you, Shalindra, on this and talk about the sharing economy, the gig economy. Uh, because, of course, if you are in the gig economy, which more and more people are if you look across the world, that means that you are sector agnostic in some ways. You're doing a bit of ride sharing, a bit of Airbnb and accommodation. Um, can, you, can you take us into the future, the next three to five years? What are the gigonomy uh, areas of employment that you expect more uh, jobs to be created in and people to be working in? So in China, it's logistics, right? Enormous increase in employment in the, logis the logistics sector as a result of the new peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms and gigonomy. What about here in Singapore uh, and in our immediate environment? So first, I'll start with an anecdote. You know, um, uh, I, I had the privilege to be in the room in, in uh, Sequoia's U.S. offices uh, one day in uh, 2009. When we, when we discussed a $600,000 seed investment uh, in a company uh, which, uh, you know, asked people to share their extra room, uh, you know, with, with strangers. And, uh, you know, that company became Airbnb. And, and um, 
you know, at the time when we sat around the table and discussed saying, look, this company's value proposition is that it will allow people to have strangers live in their homes, you know, and, uh, you know, think about it in 2009 for the first time, and, you know, it, it was very small, and it was a seed investment. I mean, you know, many of us around the table uh, had doubts and concerns, um, you know, saying, really, like, will people allow strangers to live in their homes? And, you know, for a small fee or what have you. So, um, you know, obviously, Airbnb has grown on to become this, uh, you know, humongous company, and it's, uh, you know, a, a huge uh, example of the sharing economy. And it has, I think that the point I'm trying to make is it's far surpassed our expectations. You know, we could not have possibly imagined, uh, even in our, you know, at that time sitting around the table, even as we were deciding to invest, that, um, that, this, could, that this might possibly play out uh, in the manner it did. And so the first point I want to make is in the ways in which shared infrastructure, shared workforces, you know, um, uh, uh, et cetera, might play out will surprise us by their scale and the disruptive power that they might possess. So, so the first thing is, you know, we think this is a very uh, significant trend. Like, I haven't owned a car now for three years. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm sad that there's no Uber here anymore in Singapore, <laughs> which I think many of us in the room are. But, um, but you know, I've stuck to my resolve to not buy a car um, so far. And, uh, and I'm hoping Gojek will arrive soon. But uh, um, I can see you're not a fan of Grab for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'm biased, uh, you know, shareholder in Gojek, so I'll wait for them. <laughs> um, but I, I think the implications are very vast. Uh, like I gave the example of, of, um, uh, of restaurants and so on and so forth, of logistics, like you said. But I say one more thing, I'll come back to education since we were talking about it. You know, uh, one of my favorite new examples is a company called Unacademy we invested in in India. And Unacademy allows anybody to be an educator and anybody to be a learner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, people are self-taught. They can go learn courses. They can participate in exams. And the, the interesting thing they've found is that very many good students who have, let's say, cleared an exam are ending up becoming top teachers, you know, on their platform. So the teachers of today are no longer, and so now I'm coming back to this, I call it the new gig economy. The teachers of today are no longer the teachers that you might have thought are the teachers, but they're actually students themselves mm -hmm. who are teaching other students. And, uh, you know, they have this example of a, of a kid who's in college, uh, you know, who's doing extremely well now taking paid classes, live paid remote classes on their platform, and, you know, earning significantly more than, you know, maybe he will even on graduation. Uh, but while he's still in college, because he's teaching, he's teaching uh, other kids to ace the exam that he just aced himself. Can so, I just make a quick comment as well, yeah. just on the gig economy and everything you've raised? Because it's a, it's a question in Australia uh, that we're currently looking at, obviously, from the governmental perspective. The gig economy in Australia is only about 1%. Okay, so despite all of the talk about it, it is, it is a still a very, very small part of our economy. But you are so right, it is just rapidly growing. And the issue that we then have as a government is, how do you regulate a gig economy to ensure that you continue to let it expand yeah. at this rate, but at the same time, you ensure that people are properly protected within it, in particular from the work health and safety implications. Mm -hmm. In Australia, as you know, we have a minimum wage. Um, how do you ensure that people are being paid appropriately if they're not within the current workplace relations structure? So I think from a government's perspective, there are also so many questions uh, that we need to grapple with to ensure that we're not stifling the gig economy, right. we're letting it expand, but doing so in a responsible manner. And people are asking actually about, uh, again, sort of deep diving, not just on gig, gig economy, but just generally private sector led innovation. And if, uh, where is that coming from in Australia? If it's, you know. Uh... Absolutely. I mean, in Australia, um, we, we actually have um, some world renowned inventions uh, that people are relying on here in this room. Wi Fi. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi was invented in Australia. Um, I don't think there are too many people um, who actually know that. The black box, uh, many people would have flown here today. Um, the black box was invented in Australia. The cochlear implant transforming, in particular, young children's lives. So, so in Australia, we have a proud history um, of innovation, but in terms of the actual sectors that the innovation is coming from, I think in particular, I mean, automated mining, we lead the world and we do not intend um, 
to fall behind. We have also just um, announced, though, the creation in Australia of a completely new industry um, with the creation of the Australian Space Agency. Um, this is something that, because of our unique location um, globally, we have so much that we can actually now bring to um, the global space economy. So we're very much of a proud history of innovation in Australia, but in particular when it comes to, say, mining, um, space technology, but also the growing um, areas of where jobs have been created in Australia, uh, very much our national disability insurance scheme, um, our healthcare industry is, again, huge burgeoning markets, and in particular, innovative markets. We have a very, very large country in Australia. Uh, the way we deliver services is fundamentally different mm -hmm. to so many other parts of the world. So in Australia, you have no choice. You need to be innovative to ensure that as a government, you are providing services. Mm -hmm. so there are many sectors of the Australian economy that are looking to regionalize, Asianize a lot more, and of course, not just with respect to China, where you already have such a large trade investment partnership. So the more digitally connected you are, the better. That applies in space to Singapore. So I actually want to turn uh, to you, Piyush, on this very important question, because there's, in our neighborhood, uh, any number of countries whose regulatory systems are distinctly analog uh, compared to what we have going on here. And yet, the paradox is that, quite frankly, today, you can't can't properly measure the GDP of any country without taking account the value of the flows of capital, trade, uh, goods, people, other forms of cross-border mobility. So one of the frustrations, of course, for the financial industry is that we don't yet have that fully uh, borderless, frictionless, pan-ASEAN um, uh, uh, sort of regulatory uh, harmonization that is going to allow for companies like DBS to completely seamlessly offer uh, their services. And yet that's going to be critical for Singapore to, to double down on the ASEAN growth story, not just on what's happening uh, domestically. So could you comment on the regional economic transformation, something that Chalendra has also been very, very bullish on. How are you seeing that regional transformation and how can we get the regulators to keep pace with the digital changes that you're implementing? I think it's um, uh, fair to say that uh, financial services is probably the most protected industry. Uh, you have, and that's for good reason. Most people want to retain control of the key pillars of their banking sector. Of course, the Australians are now with the commission um, revisiting some of these issues. But fundamentally, it is a protected industry. I don't see that changing anytime soon, partly because the consequences of systemic instability we have seen, partly because monetary policy agendas and regimes uh, you know, go through that channel. And frankly, I don't see that changing in a hurry. It's not just in our region. It's even at the global level. Between the Fed and the Europeans, they can't come and see eye to eye on a lot of the issues. Uh, I, so I think that barrier is going to be um, slow to come off. However, the other elements of trade and capital flows, which I do think you will see a lot more progress with. Um, I think DPM spoke about the national trade platform, the trade connectivity we're trying to create across uh, Singapore, Hong Kong to start with, but several countries around the region. It's an archaic process. There are tons of documents, tons of uh, uh, friction. You can eliminate that, and there is a lot more appetite across the region to look for common platforms and sharing to be able to make that work. E-payment regimes. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Prime Minister Modi launched Rupe Connectivity with Nets. There's another agenda to connect Singapore into Thailand. So I think e-payment regimes, which are cross-country, I think there's a lot more appetite to look for solutions uh, around that. Uh, at the fringes, market access and capital markets, you will see some of that uh, happen as well. Uh, I think at the end of the day, though, if you can create clear efficiencies, blockchain is one, smart contracts and efficiencies which uh, allow people to improve the functioning of the system without necessarily giving up sovereign oversight over the key elements of the industry, that's where you probably see the most progress. Although with capital markets, it's not just fringe. If you think about the opening of peer-to-peer -peer lending um, you know, across the region, that's actually a very large, fast-growing market. I don't think that will happen very fast because I think you'll find, as in China, that as soon as you, you pick up scale beyond a point where the regulator can control it, they will go back and start re-regulating parts of the industry. Because the reality is when you get to you get China, there are 4,000 peer-to-peer lending companies we got created. And after Izubao and the $9 billion fraud, they went back, regulated, 2,000 of them shut down in six months. Mm -hmm. right? So I think there is large sources of systemic instability The regulators go back and rethink. Mm -hmm. I think we will all be in this test and learn environment. It isn't, in fact, true. We don't know what things are like. You have to experiment and you have to test and learn. 
But in the test and learn, you will find in some cases that people will start ring fencing. So people speak a lot of things, cryptocurrency. So you can create Bitcoin, you can have universal electronic uh, currency, could you create electronic currency around a region, for example. My submission is because um, monetary policy today is still run through the banking channel and credit creation still runs through M2 and the fractional reserve process of the banking channel. It's not easy for central sovereign governments to give that up. Mm -hmm. And as long as you have a nation state and a sovereign government, it will be very hard to think of a situation where you have a third party cryptocurrency which handles all of this stuff. So I think it will take time coming. Mm -hmm. Although the crypto role in providing some liquidity for uh, entrepreneurs, for startups, is, is starting to take off with ICOs, but that could potentially be uh, another a bubble in some ways, or, or small sets of uh, bubbles. We're just about out of time, unfortunately, for this panel, and yet it's really been an enormously rich mix of potential, very high potential con uh, around where technology can take various uh, industries, but also danger and fusion in particular have raised a couple of these uh, macro risks around um, uh, pooled uh, liquidity risk, for example, and of course, data concentration uh, risk that you've all mentioned. So I think that leaves us with a lot to, to think about around uh, what scenarios we can construct for the future of uh, the region's economies. And uh, let's hope that Singapore navigates both the potential and the danger uh, uh, smartly. Um, so that is it for this uh, second panel. I want to thank our panelists. Brilliant uh, insights, truly. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here for these first two sessions. There's a lot more, as you know, uh, coming up uh, for the remainder of the day and the week. And Glenda is going to come and fill us in on all of that. But first, uh, thank you again so much to our panelists. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to our panelists for that robust exchange. Lots of buzzwords coming out from there. I, you know, it's amazing. I think uh, one thing that we're going to take away, and I remember very clearly, is data commodity is the new air. You know, Dr. Parag, why don't you just, you know, sum up some of the key, you know, highlights from, from um, this um, current panel discussion? Well, I'll try to be as a buzzword compliant as possible, seeing as the the clock uh, ticks down. But I was I was uh, very heartened by a number of the comments that were made here. The first is the role of the public sector. We wouldn't be here today having this gathering if it weren't for. Uh, for the, uh, the foresight, if you will, that's provided by the public sector. And the cycles according to which the public sector needs to learn uh, through the feedback loops in the economy and so forth and the, the, the unforeseen consequences of technology deployment, all of that was touched upon. And it all comes back to the public sector being able to absorb those challenges and to respond to them in a, in a proactive way. I was also very pleased with the pan-Asian optimism uh, and the sentiment in, in both panels. Uh, you know, I have uh, very often described Singapore as the capital of Asia. And it's not something that one can say in an official context because it may rub some people the wrong way. But I'm allowed to say it, so I'll say it again. Uh, you know, th this is uh, you know, the unofficial capital uh, of all of Asia. And that's a very uh, great responsibility, in a way, to lead the way around regulatory convergence uh, and in general, as a, with Smart Nation itself uh, being a demonstration uh, a project and having an effect on, um, on the rest of the region. And then we got into, and I think this is very important, more of a technical conversation. What does a full stack company uh, look like? What does that mean for competition within the economy? How that breaks down the silos uh, between traditional industrial uh, sectors? And everyone needs to pay very, very close attention to that. It's not the kind of thing where, especially in a, in a country that uh, tries to empower citizens towards self-reliance, uh, one has to be smart and educated and use the education that they have, whether they're acquiring it online or through the modified curricula of the uh, formal institutions in the country, to be, um, I think the term that was used was a, sort of a digitally resilient, right? And that's something that now applies to all ages. And that really humanizes this question of what smart nation needs for all of us. Um, you know, a number of questions that we didn't have time for actually in the pigeonhole related to employment. You know, and we're fortunate here to be in a nearly full employment uh, situation, uh, but that can change based on some of the disruptions uh, that many uh, of the speakers identified. So I think we had a very realistic set of conversations this morning, which despite the fact that, you know, Smart Notion connotes such incredibly positive, almost utopian f futures, this was very, very nuts and bolts. And I think that that hopefully uh, provided a lot of new information um, uh, for people to digest, to think about what they're going to do with it. So I'm uh, very, very pleased with how things have gone this morning. Right, Thank and you. as well Thank as um, legacy companies still have a role to play as well. How would you say the two, um, you know, 
uh, discussions today, how would you say the two um, intersect and how, the, how did the two connect? Well, so, you know, this is an economy, as with uh, many others in the region, quite frankly, it's, it's quite germane to Asia, as it is in, in Europe, to have uh, you know, very large uh, legacy uh, companies that have built up over the last uh, decades with state support, with state co-investment, the GLC model, uh, as we have here. And that has uh, significant virtues in terms of the stability it, it, it provides. If you really tease apart the uh, financial ecosystem of the technology sector here, of course, there is an important, very strong role, quite frankly, uh, for government resources, uh, financial resources. And the acumen that, uh, that Tomasek, GIC, and others have been building up in the technology sector is actually very, um, uh, very promising. So that is itself an example of the coexistence. Now, one of the things that no doubt uh, people who are working in that uh, field here will, will say rightly is that the more we can get the bottom-up innovations that are coming out of the Block 71 and other ecosystems to feed into some of the large legacy companies, the better, right? Uh, you know, invest in the companies that not necessarily disrupt you, but can help help you be better at what you're doing. And that is the positive effect we want to have. That might be an area that uh, no country is perfect in because this is just unfolding now, but something that Singapore can really seize upon because we are here we obviously can in a very finite way identify who are the champions that most need to modernize and innovate, who are the companies that we're bringing in or seeding that can help them uh, to, to reach that next level of uh, digitization. So I, I'm optimistic about that as well. Right. And, you know, governments have a part to play, and that is, you know, creating policies that will help all these businesses as well. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Thank Parag, you, for, you know, leading these um, two panel discussions today.